much. I'm just like, no, I don't have a problem with that. I just said, do they know the subject? Oh, that's what I meant. Okay. okay. Um, they were good? All right. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد First of all, thank you for coming and taking the time out Second thing, we, we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to grant our Sheikh Wali the speedy recovery As you know, he was supposed to continue with the tafsir of Surah Al-Kahf And uh, so, يعني, so we downgraded for you and I'm going to be doing something else Like Allah khair so I wanted to do, specifically I wanted to do the ayat of ifk in Surah An-Nur. So those who have a mushaf with them can pull up uh, Surah An-Nur verses 11. And uh, this is supposed to be from anywhere from 30 to 40 minutes. So we'll do what we can in the time given, inshallah. And uh, typically, you know, in order to do the verses, you have to go through the story of the ifk. And I'm going to assume that most people know it, or I'm going to give bits and pieces of it as we go through the the tafsir of the verses and there are a lot of lessons in the tafsir of these verses and that's why I just chose this section specifically because there are a lot of lessons that are very relevant to our life today and just a lot of things that we can benefit from inshallah so we start from verse 11 so the, the surah surah al-nur deals with very strict very serious issues issues of life and death it deals with zina deals with fornication with adultery and then it follows everything that comes as a result of that so accusing people of zina without having witnesses and then what to do with those people in court who don't have witnesses who accuse a chaste woman and then real rules of visitation knocking on people's doors before you enter seeking permission because all that is still linked to the, the same theme because someone in the old days they didn't even have rules of istidan seeking permission a person would enter your home and he would announce qad dakhalt i have entered Okay, your highness, leave the same way. <laughs> so he could say, I have entered and the, the man of the house is not there. So it's very linked to the same theme then. Okay, so we start from verse 11. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Subhanallah. <laughs> So Allah Azzawajal starts by saying Verily those who brought forth or came forth with Al-Ifq al -ifk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave this name to the incident The accusation against Aisha And just so everyone's following along uh, In one of the battles Aisha radiallahu anha was, uh, Remained behind and the army wasn't aware and they left and Safwan ibn Mu'attil al-Sulami al-Dakwani found her and he brought her back during midday, this is an important point, and dropped her back uh, at the army. So some people, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul, the leader of the hypocrites and others, they began to hint towards some haram relationship and some people specifically used the word zina. So when the incident was finally over is when these verses were, were revealed from 11 until 21. This chunk of verses were revealed proving the innocence of Aisha. And the, the wording is so powerful because you see to what level Allah Azzawajal is defending Aisha radiallahu anha. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala named this incident and named the accusation an ifk. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have called it a, a lie. A kathibah is a lie. And there's a difference between al-kathib, which is telling a lie, and al-ifq. Because a lie is an untruth. A lie is an untruth. So I say something to you that is not true, then that's a lie. So the Arabs used to use the word kathabt to refer to when you're mistaken. No, they didn't mean you lied. Yani, remember in the Battle of Uhud, when Abu Sufyan came to the base of the mountain and he yelled out to them, Is Muhammad amongst you? Is Abu Bakr amongst you? Is Umar amongst you? And the Prophet told him, don't answer. And then Abu Sufyan, and they really thought they had killed them. And there was a man dressed like the Prophet and he was killed. They thought they killed the Prophet So he wasn't lying. He really thought they killed the Prophet So he yells out, as for these three, then we have certainly rid you of them. So Umar couldn't hold it anymore. And he yells out to him, كَذَبْتْ يَا عَدُوَ Allah." He didn't say, you lied, O enemy of Allah. He said, you're mistaken. We're still alive and well. 
So, kadhabt used to mean mistaken because a lie is when what is spoken does not match reality. And a mistake is the same thing when what is spoken does not match reality. And that's why they used to interchange the words kadhabt with meaning mistaken or you lied. There is a narration where Aisha radiallahu anha was asked about a hadith of the Prophet and they said Abu Huraira said it this way. And she said kadhaba Abu Huraira. So what does she mean here? Does she mean he has lied or he's mistaken? What do you think? For sure, mistaken. But we have some people today, and they're the ones who are liars, who say, oh, you see, the biggest narrative hadith is a liar according to Aisha. La. She meant mistaken, but you guys are the liars. So, So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't call it a lie and called it an ifk. An ifk is more powerful than a lie. Why? Because they say, When something is completely flipped around, 180 degrees, there is no hint, no inkling of truth whatsoever in it. Completely false. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called the two villages of Lut, or the village of Lut, he called it, Al-Mu'tafika. Same root, Wal-Mu'tafikata Ahwa. So Mu'tafika because it was flipped around, completely reversed. So the difference between an ifk and a lie is I could say, for example, that, for example, I can say, um, I can't, uh, Sheikh Ibrahim is the only one I know. So Sheikh Ibrahim has a very gentle cat. Right? Sheikh Ibrahim has a very gentle cat. And Sheikh Ibrahim's cat is actually a very aggressive, very vicious cat. So this statement that I made, is it all a lie? Or is there some truth in it? Is there some truth? What's the truth? He has a cat, right? So Sheikh Ibrahim's cat is very gentle. But reality, his cat is very vicious. So it's not a complete lie. He does have a cat. So some of this sentence is true. But when it comes to if there is no... No, I'm sorry. Fadda. And, and, well, I, from personal experience, I've never seen a, a, a case that was so um, yani confusing. There might be one, but I think you gave the answer. You said the context. The context would tell you if they're saying it. Today, nobody uses it like that anyways. Huh. Mistaken, yes. Sheikh Ibrahim is saying in old literature it was actually used primarily to mean that you're mistaken, not that you have lied. Okay, what were we saying? Yeah, so then we're saying what's the difference between the ifk and the lie? So the the, kithba, the lie can have some truth to it. Just like in the example, it was a lie but there was truth. The Sheikh has a cap. Now realistically, Sheikh, do you have a cap? <laughs> she was vicious, excellent. But what if I tell you, Sheikh Ibrahim's cat is a very gentle cat. Sheikh Ibrahim doesn't have a cat. Never in his life got a cat. Never even thought of getting a cat. Maybe he's even afraid of cats, in the example. يعني. And he's even allergic to cats. Now when I tell you his cat is gentle, is there any truth in that statement at all? At all? And that's the if. So the lie could still have some truth, but the if has no hint of truth. And so right from the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called it an ifk, which means there's no hint of truth anywhere in this story whatsoever. And so that's why when you look at the wording of the verses defending Aisha, you'll see to what degree it's defending Aisha radiallahu anha. So Allah Azzawajal says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ جَاءُوا بِالْإِفْكِ Those who, verily those who brought forth or came forth with this complete utter lie, and there's no word in, in English for ifk, but this complete utter lie, Usbatum minkum. They're a small group from amongst you. Some of the Mufassirin said a usba is anywhere from 10 to 40 people. The point is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying it's a group from amongst you. Yani mahsubuna alaykum. Meaning that we're, they're still counted from amongst the population, still counted from amongst the Muslims. We're not going to ostracize them or make takfir of them. So they're a group from amongst you. لا تحسبوه شرا لكم. Do not consider it an evil and a bad thing for you. بل هو خير لكم. Rather, it's a good thing for you. He's saying this whole incident of the ifk. Don't consider it a bad thing. And until now, even 
even يعني, people who don't like Islam, they can't use the story of the ifk and say, look at this bad thing that happened because a lot of khair happened as a result of it. And the reputation of every man and woman in this room is protected due to these verses that were revealed here. So it's a lot of khair that will come for the ummah until the end of times. So don't consider it a bad thing, rather it's a good thing for you. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِكُلِّ مِرِئٍ مِّنْهُمْ مَكْتَسَبَ مِنَ الْإِثْمِ For each man from amongst them, مَكْتَسَبَ مِنَ الْإِثْمِ What he earned of sin. Now, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word اِكْتَسَب and he doesn't say كَسَب Now we know for example in Surah Al-Masad مَا أَغْنَى عَنْهُ مَا لُهُ وَمَا كَسَب So, which is easier to say? كَسَب or اِكْتَسَب Which one is easier to say? Kasab for sure, because iktasab, you're adding another vowel, you have to make a stop, iktasab versus just kasab. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran will use the word that's easier to pronounce for the act that's easier to do. And the word that's harder to pronounce for the act that, enti that entitles or en entails more work and energy and effort put into it. And that's why, for example, in, in Surah Al-Kahf, when actually a number of examples of just in one Surah Al-Kahf, when, um, when Musa alayhi salam came to Al-Khadr, he says, لَن تَسْتَطِيعَ مَعِيَ صَبْرًا You will not be able to be patient with me. تَسْتَطِيعَ And then, in the end, he says, ذَلِكَ تَأْوِيلُ مَا لَمْ تَسْطِعْ عَلَيْهِ صَبْرًا So which is easier, تَسْتَطِيعَ or تَسْطِعَ For sure, the second one. So he used the easier word, at the end, because at the end, I explained to you the logic behind why I did it. Now it's easy to understand. In the beginning, you didn't know the logic. Same thing with Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So Allah says, they were not able to climb over the barrier. When Dhul Qarnain put Ya'juj and Ma'juj behind the barrier, Allah says they were not able to climb over it, nor were they able to make a hole through it. Now, sta'u, sta'u. Which one is easier? Sta'u. So the verse actually, if you look at it linguistically, the hint is beautiful. The hint says it's easier to climb over the barrier than to make a hole through it. Because Allah used the easier word here and the harder word to make a hole through it. And, but of course, for those who are interested, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides them away from the easy one. Wallahi alhamd, right? Otherwise, they'll be, they'll be with us right now. So, here, لكل امرئ منهم مكتسب من الاثم, and it wasn't كسب. اكتسب harder to say because the scholars say something very nice. They said that the halal is easier to do, and when you do something that's halal, you do it very relaxed, very nonchalantly, and with no, you know, guilty conscience or anything. The haram, when you do the haram you have to put effort into hiding it as well and into doing it, you know. If you growing up have known anyone who's a smoker, you see the smoker is a very resourceful person. Before he lights up, he checks the direction of the wind, yeah. He has extra mint in his car, change of clothing, colognes. They just put so much effort because they have to hide the haram. Haram always needs more work to be done in it. And so, يعني, I always give the example, if someone is walking in the mall with his wife, how does he walk around the mall? He walks around the wall with his wife, Khalas, very casual, he's walking around. If he's walking around the mall with his sister, he doesn't know her very well, what happens? Very different story, he's looking for Muslims, checking for Muslims, checking for all the time, just checking before he enters the store, oh, wait one second. Okay, no Muslims, Bismillah, yeah. Bismillah, Tayyip, okay. So here, they, they put effort because they did the haram, and the halal, you do it easily. For each man from amongst them, what he earned of sin. What he earned of sin. And as for the one who has the greatest share therein, and the majority of Muslims say, this is talking about the leader of the hypocrites in Medina, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salut. Because he started it, and he never explicitly used the word zina. The ones who used the word zina were righteous people. And they were the poet of the Prophet ﷺ, Hassan ibn Thabit, the sister of the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, Zainab ibn Tujahsh, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, her sister Hamna ibn Tujahsh, explicitly used the word zina, and a man who attended the battle of Badr, a Badri, Mistah ibn Abi Mistah, or Mistah ibn Uthatha. So these three righteous people fell into it and they were punished for it. 
Now, a lot of times you hear people commenting on this verse and they'll tell you, SubhanAllah, this shows you how dangerous the hypocrites are. That they started it, but they were careful to never use the word zina, so they escaped. And the believers fell into it and they were punished for it. But let's look at it from a different angle. Let's say that the believers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purified them from this sin. Hassan ibn Thabit is a righteous man. He was the poet of the Prophet He used to defend the Nabi The Prophet used to tell him, Uhjuhum wa ruhul qudsi ma'ak. Yeah, the hija is when you destroy someone with your lines of poetry. You would say, attack them and Jibreel is with you. So this is a righteous man. But Allah Azza wa purified him from this major sin. So they were purified from the sin here. And then the leader of the hypocrites, can we say he got away? How can you say he got away when in the, in the Quran, Allah is promising him severe torment? Does that sound like someone who got away? It doesn't, right? So another angle perhaps is to say the believers were purified from it. And this person, Allah said, just wait. You've got a special treatment coming. So it doesn't sound like he got away, does it? Maybe in the dunya, we, we've got both dunya and akhirah. So that was verse 11. Verse 12 is very, very powerful. And Allah Azza wa is teaching the believing men and women how they should have reacted when they heard the news or they heard the accusation. Which means you should have when you heard it. Or why didn't you behave this way when you heard it? When you heard it, This verse is so, so powerful. Because, Allah, it's so powerful. Look. And imagine there's a righteous person in the community and people are accusing him of zina and they don't have any witnesses. All right? So you don't like him. You don't like that guy. But you know that you don't have evidence against him. So when people come and ask you, what do you think of the accusation against this person? You say, why we have no proof. We have no right to say this. And it's, it's haram and it's incorrect. And you defend him very nicely. Good, right? But internally, you think he did it. Now, you're defending him verbally because you don't have any evidence. But internally, in your heart, you believe he did it. You see? So here, you did your part in court because we don't have evidence. So I verbally defended him. But internally, I think he did it. Verse 12, subhanAllah, is telling the believing men and women how they should react verbally and internally. And it's not acceptable in the case of Aisha to defend her verbally because there's no evidence, but internally thinks she did it. You see how powerful that is? And here it is. It says, Lola if samartumuhu, why didn't you when you heard it? Or you should have when you heard it. Dhan. And dhan is it? Dhan is yani thinking. And and uh, yani basically yani it's not just thinking, but it's it's basically um, yani what kind of opinion or conclusion you've come with here. So, what's what it means here? They should have thought well, internally. They should have thought well. So it's not acceptable to defend her verbally and internally don't think well of her. So you should have thought well. Now, Now, it's very interesting here because this word for themselves is the same word for uh, each other. Yeah, it's really beautiful, right? Just shows you so much unity from one word that means two things. It means yourself and it means each other. Same word. Which shows you what a unit we are. It's very beautiful, yes? Yes? Strong meaning. Yeah, everyone understands? Okay, one person has moved. What's, what's going on? People came straight from work or what? Okay. But you see how, the, how powerful that is? So it's, that's why sometimes in the tafsir you see people should have thought well of themselves. And sometimes we'll say you should have thought well of each other. But it's the same word and it means both. So powerful. Shows you how much we're supposed to be one unit. So now internally you should have thought well of each other and yourselves. Some of the Mufassirin said Aisha is the mother of the believers. And so nobody would think that of their own mother. So that's why you think well of yourself. It's like your own mother. Nobody would think that. Then, وَقَالُوا Which is now external. هَذَا إِفْكُمْ مُبِينَ So powerful. Now, so we've taken care of it internally, and now when they spoke, they should have, they should have said, this is not just ifk, which is a very powerful word anyways, ifkum mubin, clear ifk, clear obvious lie. Why is it clear and obvious? Because Safwan ibn Mu'attal as-Sulami 
when he dropped off Aisha, she said, we overtook the army at the last rest stop, at the last place before entering Medina. And then she specifically says, when the sun was at the, uh, at the extreme heat of midday, she said, at the extreme heat of midday, which means the sun is out. So do, do they, is this the behavior of guilty people? And Safwan is leading his camel and Aisha is on it. And he leads it in cutting through the whole army and the sun is out, everyone can see them. And then he sits the camel down right in front of the tent of the Prophet and he leaves. Now, do guilty people behave like that? Guilty people, when they get close to Medina, say, okay, you go from this door, and I'll come four days later from the back door. And I'm not going to enter the city with each other. And we're not going to enter during the day. We enter when the sun is down and it's night, under cover of night. But he dropped her off in the middle of the day. So let me put this in contemporary terms. I'm sorry for the example, but if uh, let's just use contemporary English terms. If a woman is cheating on her husband, that man puts her in his car and he drives her and drops her off in her house in front of her husband. And here she is. It's impossible. So that's why they should have said this is a clear, obvious lie. How could this be? How could the guilty people come like this and just drop her off in the middle of the, of the day? No way. It doesn't make any sense. So you should have said this is an obvious lie and you should have internally also realized it was an obvious lie. That's why verse 12 is so powerful. Shaykhna, when do we stop? Just give me the five minute mark and we'll stop. So now verse 12 is how you should have behaved and you should have thought internally and externally. And then verse 12 is the legal side. So why didn't they or they should have brought forth concerning this accusation for arba'ati shuhada. Shuhada here not martyrs, taban. Witnesses. They should have brought four witnesses. This is the legal proceeding. Then Allah Azza says, فَإِذْ لَمْ يَأْتُوا بِالشُّهَدَاءِ It's very powerful also. Since they did not bring four, or if, and if they don't bring four witnesses, then فَأُولَٰئِكَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ هُمُ الْكَاذِبُونَ So some of the Mufassirin even said, فَأُولَٰئِكَ distancing language, them way over there. So Allah is distancing Himself from them. فَأُولَٰئِكَ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ هُمُ الْكَاذِبُونَ This is really, really powerful. Because, let's put it this way. Let's say three righteous men. They see someone committing zina. And everyone knows that they're righteous and with upstanding and everything. And they see a person committing zina and they see everything very clearly. They go to court and the judge knows them personally. He knows their taqwa and their righteousness and salah. Does he accept their testimony? No, because there are three. You have to be four witnesses. So he doesn't accept their testimony. According to the courtroom and according to the law of Allah on earth, are they liars? They are. According to court, you have to be four or you're liars, even five. But with Allah, did they lie? They didn't, right? But here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say that they are the ones who are al-kadhibun. But he said, Even with Allah, they're liars. You see what that means? Because I could be telling the truth in court, but according to the law, I'm lying, even though I'm not really lying. I'm not a liar, but according to court, I'm a liar. But here, even with Allah, they're liars. Do you see how powerful that is? Yes? Very strong, yes? Okay. So then that's the legal part. In Surah An-Nur, the scholars say, we see this a number of times. We see it in verse 10, we see it in verse 14, verse 21, I think, and 22. So a number of times in the beginning of the surah, Allah keeps reminding, had it not been for the grace of Allah and His mercy upon you, and then He'll say something else. And the scholars say Allah keeps reminding of His grace and His mercy because the surah is dealing with punishments. And so nobody is, is overtaken with all the, the, the punishments and if it comes off harsh, that you might forget that Allah is being merciful to you and you might forget that Allah has other bounties upon you. So because it's talking about punishment, Allah kept reminding you that He's His mercy and of His bounties. وَلَوْلَا And had it not been فَضْلُ اللَّهِ Which is the graces and the bounties of Allah عَلَيْكُمْ upon you وَرَحْمَتُهُ And His mercy فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ In this world and in the next لَمَسَّكُمْ يعني It would have touched you. Not it, it touched, but it would have touched you. It came close to touching you. فِيمَا أَفَضْتُمْ فِيهِ الْإِفَاضَ Is when you rush into something. So a severe torment would have touched you concerning what you rushed into. 
Because that's what they did. Everybody rushed into it. Right. So, uh, verse 15. إذ, oh, for, look how powerful verse 15 is. إذ تلقونه بألسنتكم التلقي is when you receive something. So, which, which instrument, and which, what do we use for talaqi, receiving information? The ears, right? But look what Allah Azza says in verse 15. إِذْ تَلَقَوْنَهُ بِأَلْسِنَتِكُمْ When you receive the news with your tongues, and you receive news with your ears, but why the tongues? Because Allah Azza is giving you this visual, that the information didn't go into the ear, you process it in your mind, and then it comes out, and you rephrase it. But it, it, was, it came, you received it with the same instrument that passes it on. So it didn't go into the brain, you didn't think about it. And what an amazing way of saying you didn't think about it, just by saying you received it with your tongues. So this is the visual. You got it, and it bounced off instantly. Never thought about it. Very strong, very descriptive. When you received it, with your tongues. And you say with your mouths, ما ليس لكم به علم what you have no knowledge of وتحسبونه هينا and you consider it to be something easy something light marginal trivial وهو عند الله عظيم but with Allah it is something great it is something heavy just like the the hadith when the Prophet said إن الرجل يتكلم بالكلمة من سخط الله a man will say a, a, a word and it angers Allah عز وجل لا يلقي لها بالا in one narration he does not give it any attention and it will cause him to fall into the hellfire the depth how deep will he fall into the hellfire the distance between that between the heavens and the earth that's how deep he falls into the hellfire from a word that he just thinks it's nothing and it with Allah Azawajal it's something heavy it's something deep وهو عند الله عظيم then verse 16 says وَلَوْلَا إِذْ سَمِعْتُمُوهُ Now verse 16 again is telling you how you should have reacted. You should have when you heard it, this news, this accusation, قُلْتُمْ You should have said, مَا يَكُونُ لَنَا أَنَّ نَتَكَلَّمَ بِهَذَا It is not proper for us to speak of this and to pass on this kind of information. سُبْحَانَكَ هَذَا بُهْتَانٌ عَظِيمٌ سُبْحَانَكَ هَذَا بُهْتَانٌ عَظِيمٌ سُبْحَانَكَ is when you say, you, you basically you're far removing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from any imperfection or from any negative thing attributed to him. So that's why a lot of times you will find it uh, translated in English as how perfect you are or glory be to you. To remove Allah from anything that's, that's attributed to him that's not correct. And also people say this word when they're surprised. And that's why when Aisha goes to her mother and she finds out about he verifies the story of the if she said subhanallah are people really saying that so people say that when they're surprised so you should have been surprised too not just like casual information you should have been surprised and then you should have said this is an obvious buhtan is a lie also now someone says okay well why did allah subhanahu wa ta'ala one time call it an if another time call it buhtan and the more adjectives you use to describe something or, or the more yeah, yeah, adjectives you describe something the more it shows how serious it is يعني, someone was betrayed by his brother and he just says this is betrayal or this guy says this is betrayal this is treachery this is backstabbing this is the fifth column this all these adjectives oh wow makes it a big deal so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called it an if and also called it buhtan and azim also a great lie as well then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and verse 17 is very, very powerful. Allah. <laughs> Al-Mu'idha is an admonition. So what does it mean when Allah admonishes? So some of the Mufassireen, Qatada, Ibn Abbas, عنهم, Allah, that it, it means yanhakum, يعني Allah forbids you. And others says Allah makes it haram for you. If Allah admonishes you, it means He's forbidding you or He's making it haram for you. So Allah makes it haram for you. يَعِذُكُمُ Allah. And ta'udu that you return and watch this. Limithlihi abada. It's so powerful. Yani this verse is saying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it haram for you to ever go back to saying something like this again. He didn't say Allah forbids you from going back to the story of Aisha ever again and resurrecting this accusation ever again. No. Don't you ever do anything like this to anyone else on earth again. See how powerful that is? 
And that's why with verse 17, you wonder at these people today who try to resurrect the accusation against Aisha and they say she's guilty. You know who we're talking about, right? Yeah, those guys, right? But you know and I know and Allah knows that's enough, yes? Okay, the Shia. So the, <laughs> but the point is that يعني, Allah Azza wa Jalla, where would they, how could they escape verse 17? Verse 17 doesn't say, don't you ever mention the story of Aisha again. Verse 17 says, don't you ever do this to any woman ever again. And in the Muslim state, anyone who is chaste is protected by these laws. Meaning, if someone accuses a nun, a nun, and she's known for chastity, someone accuses a nun of zina, and he doesn't have witnesses, he's whipped, whether he's Muslim or Christian. If a, a, a man accuses a Jewish woman who is chaste also, then she, he was also punished, whether he's Muslim or not, because everyone's reputation is protected by the state. Something that's very, very important. And now countries that claim they will do this and that for the rights of women, they don't protect the most important thing for a woman, and that's her reputation. And if you imagine, Jibreel alayhi salam is giving uh, Maryam, the daughter of Imran, amazing news of one of the five greatest prophets ever to be born. And he, she doesn't say when is the baby shower, the due date. She, she said, wait a bit, what about my reputation? How do I explain this to people? Anyone else would say, oh, this is fantastic news. Forget my reputation. When is the prophet coming? But look, the most important thing is the reputation. And Islam in the Muslim state yani, protects that reputation. Uh, let me ask a quick question here. All right. I don't know. Let's ask it. Okay. So let's say we have a local imam is a righteous man. Everybody likes him, respects him. And there is a girl and she has yeah, any boyfriends and they spend the night in her apartment and multiple boy coming, going like that. And then the imam says, she's a zania. So in this case, is the imam whipped for slander yeah, in the Muslim state? Is he punished for slander or do we let him go? Or do we give him a warning? He needs to provide witnesses. So the verse, verse 4 of Surah An-Nur says, you have to have witnesses or you're going to be punished. So do we punish the imam? Actually, the verse says, and those who, okay, I'll give it away. The verse says, and those who accuse chaste women. All right. So now do we whip the imam or do we give him a warning or do we just let him go? Naam? Whip him? Yeah? In the Muslim still. Let's just be in the Muslim because here. Okay. Yeah? The Imam and the girl Ma'roof. Um, by the way, just let me give this. Okay. Okay. You have to see it. You have Mushbas, you have to see it. Four people have to see it at the same time. Uh, by the way, just a disclaimer, Yani. Uh, these laws will only expiate sins and they can only be performed by the ruling government. So you can't have. And you can't, someone who commits zina in America and he goes, knocks on his best friend's basement window and says, listen, Habib, I, I need you to whip me on my back 100 times. If you go to your best friend, you have him whip your back 100 times, it does not expiate any sin. All that happened is your best friend whipped you on your back 100 times. That's all that happened. <laughs> the sin is still there. Believe it or not, the majority of scholars say, no, we don't whip the imam. Because the verse says, those who accuse chaste women. And this woman, she has, she's not chaste by any definition. What are they doing, playing chess? Well, there's a hadith, and there's a woman, and she was known for, for her zina. Now, did anyone see kida? But she was known for it. So Nabi Wasallam said something very interesting, not because he wanted to punish her, but to teach us a lesson. He said, If I would have taken anyone for punishment without evidence, I would have whipped, I would, I would have stoned her. He doesn't say, he's not saying, I wish I could stone her. He's telling us, even though you know what's happening, you don't do it because there's no evidence. That's not our job. We're not out there to investigate and put cameras and catch people. The idea is to, we don't, re, uh, What's the word? Expose. We don't expose people. So the majority of scholars say the verse is offering protection to chaste women only. So if it's a nun that's chaste, a Majan woman that's chaste, a Jewish woman, anything that's any woman, chaste, 
she's protected. But if she's not chased and she's going and coming, yes, we don't have clear evidence, but that's not about the evidence here. Do we call her chaste? In what world is that woman with multiple boyfriends who spend the night is called chaste? So the verse isn't really saying evidence, evidence is saying just chaste. As long as she's known for chastity, we don't say anything about her. And then she's protected by the law. But if she's not known for chastity, it doesn't matter if they're playing chess or not. We still... Now, can we reprimand the imam? Of course. Can you do something else for the imam? Yes. I recommend you get an, like five or six people that the imam is very, very scared of and have them reprimand him. I mean the board of the masjid. <laughs> Okay, so you're using the most extreme, crazy, crazy example, Yani? It is extreme. You don't think it's extreme to say if you go to school you're not chased? I wow. No, but we're not talking about that. You, you brought an example of people who just being judgmental and saying if she lives alone, she's not chaste. But we're talking about a girl who has guys who sleep over in her house. Would you, like, do you have a brother? Okay, so if your brother said, I want to marry a chaste woman, would you go find him a girl with multiple boyfriends who spend the night and then tell him, Allah, she's a chaste sister? Just answer my question. For you, is that chaste? Khalas then. Now, we don't judge. Naam. You're going to culture. We didn't, we didn't do culture yet. We're not saying culture. We're saying someone has multiple boyfriends who spends the night. Tell me in which culture, what part of the world, and which masjid we call this chaste. Just stick with our example. We're not going to extremists who are saying, Yalla, if you sneeze, you're not chaste. Those are mawjudeen. And if your hijab has a little bit of color outside of black, khalas, right? So within reason, and by the way, people exaggerate. Go like, don't judge. Don't judge. Type one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us for the sighting of the moon for Ramadan, for example, that they have to be upright and righteous people. Type, yeah, don't judge. How do you know they're righteous? Type, what if I see someone coming out of the nightclub and he's walking like this? I'm driving by the nightclub and I see him coming out. Hey, uh, Bismillah, brother Hassan. And he's walking out like this. Say, yeah, brother, don't judge. How do you know that he's getting drunk? Maybe he was inside telling people, Ittaqullah. Somebody punched him and he came out like this. Aywa, طيب, خلص. You add him to your sister then, and we'll see how that goes. So that means within reason, and we're not using these extreme examples. We're saying what Allah allowed us. Bas, only. We're not going crazy. خلاص. Sheikh, is it time? يعني أنا enjoy this, but I don't want to like take long. Let's do one more verse and we'll give. يعني we'll do one more verse and then we'll stop. Because that's so powerful, yeah. Allah forbids you, verse 17, to ever do this again to anyone else. So if Allah says, don't you dare do this to anybody else on earth, how dare anyone try to resurrect the same accusation against Aisha radiallahu anha? How will you escape verse 17? I, so if you ever encounter one of those people, give him verse 17, see what he can. There's nothing to say. I haven't had that experience, but enjoy it. Look at verse 17 and tell me how could you ever do that. وَيْبَيْنُ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ الْآيَاتِ وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ So, and Allah makes the ayat clear. The ayat here means the verses. Many times people love to translate ayat as signs only. But Allah is not mentioning signs here. And uh, there's an, يعني, if you look at the verses that mention ayat, because the word ayah means verse, verses, يعني, or ayah, verse, or it can mean a sign, or it can mean an, an admonition, a mawa'idah, an admonition. So how do we know which one is being used from the, from the context? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the sun, the moon, the stars, night and day, and says these are the ayat of Allah, it means the signs. If Allah mentions verses or the book and the Arabic and so on, then you know, okay, it's mentioning the verses here. So Allah began Surah An-Nur by talking about clarifying the verses and revealing and sending down the verses. And here again, Allah clarifies his ayat, Wallahu alimun hakim. Uh, now, let's just, this is 19. This is the real last verse. Verse 19 is the last one we're doing, inshallah. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُحِبُّونَ أَن تَشِيعَ الْفَاحِشَةُ فِي الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ So, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُحِبُّونَ أَن تَشِيعَ الْفَاحِشَةُ One of the students, one time we did this verse, he said, Ah, you see, تَشِيعَ, شيعة. 
No, <laughs> it has nothing to do with that. The verse is saying, uh, this verse is so powerful, verse 19. It's saying, verily those who love, and tashia, يعني, it spreads. Those who love that the fahisha, and in the Quran when the word fahisha occurs, it's generally and for the most part referring to illicit sexual behavior, يعني, fornication, adultery, like that. So, verily those who love that fornication, zina, spreads the Shia, fil-ladina amun, spreads amongst the believers, lahum adabun alimu fi dunya wal akhirah. For them is a severe torment in this world and in the next. Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamun, and Allah knows and you don't know. Now, some of the mufassirin said this verse is threatening those who, who accused Aisha, those who spread the news. Some of the Mufassirin said, these are the people who accused Aisha or these are the people who will accuse any, underline, chaste woman. That's their punishment. That's what Allah is warning them of. But some of the Mufassirin said something very powerful. They said this verse is not threatening those who spread. He said, look at the wording of the verse. Inna ladina yuhibbuna an al fahisha. They said this verse is warning and threatening those who love that the fawahish spread amongst the believers. And so in this tafsir, and feel free to pick whichever you like. Yani. But so the first tafsir is saying those who spread it, email, whatever, text it, whatever, those, this is their punishment. But the other mufassirin said those who love for it to spread. Yani, there is a fitna that's igniting all over the, the community. I did not take part in this fitna. Everyone is talking about it, texting about it, emailing about it, putting it on their Facebook and all these other places where people gather sin. And he says, okay, I am not, I don't have anything to do with it. I'm just staying away. I didn't text or speak or open my mouth about this. But I'm so happy that this fitna is happening because I hate that brother. So these Mufassirin said, this verse is not even threatening those who actively pers uh, pursued it or pushed it and spread it. It's just threatening those who love for it to spread. And it's so powerful. Because why would you love something like that to spread? Wallah, they might hire me or the guy as the imam. Alhamdulillah, this fitna came, ruined his reputation. So you're so happy. No, don't even be happy like that. Because it affects one person, it affects every other person. And... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put your reputation at such a high place that he made it impossible to prove zina in court. He made it impossible to... Because the four witnesses being righteous and upstanding and seeing something very explicit, what are the odds that's going to happen? That's why Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah said, there has not been a single case of zina proved by the, wit by the four testimonies since the death of the Prophet until his time. And we can say from his time until our time, there has not been a single case of zina proved through the four witnesses. And even if they saw it, they're, they're actually encouraged to not turn it in. Yani if four righteous people saw zina like that, they say, listen, you guys, we have a chance to make history. This has never been done. We will be in all the fiqh books. People will talk about us. Bismillah, let's do it. Here there's the fuqah who said, here they're not supposed to spread it. Because the idea is a sitr. We're supposed to cover each other's faults. And that's why when, and, and we'll finish, I promise. When Ma'az ibn Malik, Ma'az ibn Malik was a companion, who, he committed zina. And so a man by the name of Hazal, who was his friend from Banu Aslam, he encouraged him to go turn himself in. So then he went and turned himself in. And the Prophet ﷺ goes to Hazal. After Ma'az was dealt with and everything. He goes to Hazal and he says, Ya Hazal. So you think there'll be a reward. Thank you for turning him in. We don't want people's blood. So he said, Ya Hazal. What a horrible thing you have done. It's so powerful. He says, if you would have concealed him with the edge of your garment. He didn't say it would have been good for him. Obviously it would be good for him. It would have been good for you to conceal him. So powerful, right? And so the idea is that we can seal and we don't, you know, reveal and expose. And that's why until now, scholars don't consider pregnancy without outside of marriage. They don't consider pregnancy to be zina or proof of zina. And they don't consider video evidence, even if it's HD. They don't consider that because it could be altered. And the rule is idra'ul hudud bil shubuhat, meaning you push away the prescribed punishment with whatever doubtful matters you can find.
So I can cast doubt on the video that you present as evidence and say video can be edited, uh, it can be a body double, it could be his evil twin, it could be anything. So the judge's job is to say there's doubt, let me throw this case out. So the judge is on your side, which is a very different philosophy in the Islamic courtroom. I mean, the judge is on your side. All right, and the last thing, the, the end of the verse says, Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamun. Some people said that Allah, because it says they will have a severe torment in the dunya and in the akhirah. So some scholars said, some of the said that means, and Allah knows and you don't know, meaning Allah knows what kind of punishment they will get in the dunya and the akhirah and you don't know. And others said, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallahu ya'lam wa antum la ta'lamun, Allah knows and you don't know, it means when you don't know, and even if there's a human being next to you that knows, what do you do? Follow their guidance. So when Allah knows and you don't know, that means you just follow what Allah says. Same thing if you're driving your car next to you is a doctor. And then you see an accident on the road. When you go out, the doctor is, you're going to listen to what the doctor does because you're not a doctor. And if you're not a doctor, then you ruin the example. But if you're not a doctor, you don't tell him, listen, I watched a lot of these hospital shows. Just give me five milligrams. Of, you don't know any of that. So you stay quiet. And whatever the doctor says, apply pressure here. You do, yes, sir. Yes, doctor. Or your mechanic and your car starts steaming. You listen to what he says because he knows and you don't know. So what it means, whenever you're even with a human being who knows and you don't know, you just follow what they do and what they say. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and you don't know, then follow his guidance and you will be guided. So th I know I went over. So thank you so much for staying and being alert and attentive. Barakallahu feekum for coming. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.